Well, good morning, everybody who is part of the elect exiles of the dispersion in Gainesville and Micanopy and High Springs and Alachua. Um, sort of an Eric new paraphrase of 1 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. Um, will you join me in prayer? Um, Holy Spirit, we pray that you would shine the light of your illumination on the words that we're going to study this morning. I ask that you would open our eyes and open our minds, that you could take these words that you inspired Peter to write, that you could take the words that I will speak this morning, that you would take each of our thoughts and you would use them to make us more like Jesus. I pray that our thoughts this morning as we come together in worship would be pleasing in your sight. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, anytime you read a text, every text occurs within a larger context, and that, of course, is true with Scripture. And as we start our Scripture this morning, the very first word reminds us of that point. So, so, it's pointing back to tell us that something's already been said, so something else is true. And so we look back at what we studied last week. And 1 Peter 1.22 says that we have purified our souls by our obedience to the truth. Our obedience to the truth, it's speaking to our salvation. And that idea that Peter's referring back to our salvation is affirmed in verse 23 when Peter says that we have been born again of imperishable seed. So our salvation, our status in Christ Jesus is the foundation from which we then are commanded to love one another earnestly from a pure heart. So so two observations about the context within which today's passage is built. First of all, our salvation is a common thread that binds us together as a community. Secondly, that as members of this community of believers, we are a people who love one another earnestly from a pure heart. So, today's passage is written to us as members of this new community, bound together by nothing other than our salvation in Christ Jesus. And verse 1 continues. It says, so, put away. Okay, so put away. The idea underlying this Greek word is that of, of taking off a garment. So, imagine that it's a hot day in Gainesville. This is a hard thing to imagine, right? And you've just been outside and you've spent the last hour mowing the lawn. You're soaked with sweat. Your shirt is dirty. It's filthy. It smells bad. So what do you do? You go inside and you tear that thing off so that you can take a shower and be clean. And then you put on a fresh, clean shirt that just feels so good. That, that's the image. Believers must take off the sinful patterns of the life that we wore before our salvation. Because, you see, now we're in Christ, and therefore we wear the clean, beautiful garments of holiness, which he enables us to wear. Okay, so grammar note, yeah, I'm a nerd. Um, The verb there, put away, It's plural. It's addressing us as a community of believers as well as individuals. But it's addressing us as a community. But jump forward just a little bit, would you please, to verses 9 and 10. You'll get more confirmation that today's passage speaks to us as a church. Verse 9, but you, it's plural, y'all in Greek, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Did you notice that every last one of those nouns was a collective noun, not an individual noun? Let's go verse 10 now, okay? Once y'all, it's what it says in the Greek, really, it says y'all. Once you, plural, were not a people, but now you, plural, are God's people. Once you, plural, had not received mercy, but now you, yeah, you got it, plural, have received mercy. 
Every single one of those pronouns is y'all. And every one of those nouns is collective. You know, as we are coming out of a year of COVID-induced isolation, I think this passage is good for us to remember that the Bible speaks to us not just individually, which it does, but it also speaks to us collectively as a family, as a community, as the household of God. I think it's also a healthy reminder for us as Westerners because we just have this built-in tendency, like John Wayne, to be individuals. So, we understand the context of the text now, right? It's addressing us as a community of believers. So, what does Peter say to us? Peter's going to address three aspects of living in Christian community. First, our walk. Second, our diet. And third, our vocation. So, let's get started. Our walk. Go back to verse 2, or verse 1, would you please? Put off is telling us how we should live as a Christian community, our walk. It says that we are to put off, to take off, throw away, malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander, because these things have no place in Christ's church. These are the opposite of the command we just received in verse 22, to love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Look at the list again. Malice, and deceit, hypocrisy, envy, speaking slanderous words. Each of these things actually works to destroy community. They tear at the fabric of our church by breaking the individual threads of love in Christ Jesus that bind us together. These cannot be tolerated within the community of faith. They are filthy garments that need to be taken off, and thrown away, and burned in an enormous bonfire. And they need to be replaced by the garments of love that Peter wrote about in chapter 1, 22 to 25. So that's the first aspect of Christian living in a community that he addresses is our walk. The second one is our diet. You go to verse 2. Trust me. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up into salvation. So we see like newborn infants, and immediately we start thinking, aha, he's saying that his readers are immature Christians. Not in this passage, no. He's writing this book to all of the Christians in all of Asia Minor. Many of those people who were at Pentecost, in Jerusalem, who heard Peter's sermon on Pentecost, who received the Holy Spirit, went home to Asia Minor and told their friends, and the church grew. So the idea that this letter is written exclusively to immature baby Christians, it, it, it boggles the mind. It can't be the case. Peter is writing to churches to have a blend of brand new Christians, and hallelujah for that, and people who are mature in their faith who have walked with the Lord through hard times for year after year after year. He's talking to the church at large. He's writing to all believers. Okay, so why then does he use the metaphor of a newborn infant? Well, I think there are two reasons. First of all, because newborn infants are absolutely, totally, completely dependent upon their parents for life. And guess what? We are absolutely, totally completely dependent upon the triune God for our lives, just like those infants. Secondly, infants long for milk. And the verb that Peter uses here actually is really strong. It's like like a craving. It's powerful. So, what does milk do for a baby? Well, it gives them every last bit of nourishment they need to grow in health and in size and maturity. It's the very substance of life for a baby. Similarly, we should crave, desire eagerly, pure spiritual milk because it contains everything that we need to grow in salvation, and it is the very substance of our lives. At least one of you out there is saying, okay, Eric, great, but what is spiritual milk? Can you buy it at Publix? No, no. 
If, to answer that question, we need to do a little bit of, of nerd work, and we're going to go into our, our Greek grammars and our Greek dictionaries. We discover that the word Peter uses is, you're going to recognize the word probably, logikos. Do you hear logic in there, logikos? It's used for things that are reasonable and rational. And I think he uses it because the root is logos, a word that you've probably heard. Logos is the Greek word for word. And you know what? Jesus himself is the logos. John chapter 1, verse 1, a verse that I'm sure you love. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So you see, we are saved because of the divine logos, the divine word, Jesus. Moreover, all of Scripture, the whole Bible is God's logos, God's word, and the gospel that brought each of us salvation is part of that logos. So when Peter says spiritual or logikos milk, I think what he's after here is he wants us to understand that the pure spiritual milk that causes us to grow is the Word of God. God uses this Word, this pure spiritual milk, to nourish us, to, to sanctify us. You know, if we have a strong craving for the Word, like that of a hungry infant, we'll read our Bible. Oh yeah, and then, then we'll think about what we read. And then maybe we'll go and talk to a friend about it. And maybe read some more because some questions came up. And all that whole time, the Holy Spirit is working through that Word to sanctify us, to gradually make us more and more like Christ Jesus, to make us the image bearers that we are created to be. And that is why Peter urges us to crave pure spiritual milk because, well, he says it right there in the verse, so that by it you may grow up into salvation. You see, the Word is central to our salvation. It was in the beginning. Each one of us was born again because we heard the gospel proclaimed to us. It might have been through the loving voice of your mom or your dad or a grandparent. It could have been in church, a youth pastor, who knows, but somehow or another you heard the Word. You trusted in Jesus and you were saved. But then, for the rest of our lives, we continue to hear the Word in one way or another, and the Holy Spirit continues to work through that sanctifying us. And that's another aspect of our salvation, and that's what Peter's talking about here. Now, notice in verse 3, Peter says that you should crave the spiritual milk if, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. That's a verse that a lot of us have memorized. It's a beautiful verse. It comes from Psalm 34. In Psalm 34, early in the psalm, David is suffering. He's being afflicted, and so he seeks the Lord in the psalm, and he seeks the Lord because he is confident that the Lord will deliver him. And then in the psalm, David marvels. He's like, oh, look at the wonderful way that God cares for the people who love him. And therefore, after thinking about the wonderful way the Lord cares for us, David cries out in verse 8, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. What he's saying is, experience the Lord is good, and you can taste that, you can feel it, you can experience it in your own lives every day. So Peter, writing to Christians in the first century who are suffering persecution, is suggesting them, look at the ways that your family, your church community has experienced Jesus, even in the midst of horrible hard times. Taste and see that Jesus has been good to you, churches of Asia Minor. And he gives the same encouragement to us today, Creekside. As we're coming out of the pandemic, we should taste, reflect, remember, consider all of the ways that the Lord has been at work within this family of believers, within this community. Taste and see that he is good. So our diet, we crave pure spiritual milk so that we will grow, and we want to grow because we have tasted, we have experienced something of the Lord's goodness, and it was so good that we just want more. The third aspect of Christian 
community that Peter addresses today is our vocation. So what is our vocation? I'll I'll spare you the the trouble of worrying. Let's just jump right to the middle of verse 5. Peter says that we are to be a holy priesthood. We're going to take the rest of our time today exploring verses 4 to 9 to learn something about this holy priesthood that collectively is all of our vocation. We begin. So go to verse 4. Our new vocation is a holy priesthood that is founded on Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. That's why Peter says, as you come to him. So everything that follows is founded upon Christ Jesus. Peter's going to quote heavily from the Hebrew Bible, and he's going to use a metaphor for Jesus, which is a stone, a rock. And that metaphor appears in a couple of different ways. In verse 4, we hear that Jesus is a living stone. Stones aren't usually alive, but he's a living stone. Jesus is alive. Let's pretend it's Easter Sunday. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen, and he is reigning. Then you look in verse 6, you discover that Jesus is a cornerstone, chosen and precious. Now, I wish there was an architect in the house that I could bring up and ask for help, but I'll just have to wing it, okay? A cornerstone is either the keystone that is laid in the foundation that is necessary for all the rest of the structure to rest, or if you think of a Roman arch, the keystone is that stone right up at the very top center of the arch that is necessary for the structure of the entire arch. You take away the keystone, the thing falls down. If the keystone is not just right, The arch falls. Both of those images of the keystone, of the cornerstone, are beautiful depictions of the role Jesus plays in our salvation. I mean, everything rests on Jesus. He holds everything together. So the Scripture rightly says that Jesus is a cornerstone, chosen and precious. Now, those words chosen and precious, I think Peter uses those intentionally to encourage the believers in Asia who are suffering persecution. Because by using those, he's reminding us that the Father has exalted Jesus to the highest place, that Jesus has the name that is above every name. And therefore, Peter is calling us and calling them to worship Jesus at all times, even in times of suffering. And worship team, thank you for that first second hymn we sang, because it hit this note exactly perfectly. We cry out to him in worship in difficult times. Peter also wants us to know that we should trust him completely, no matter our circumstances. They're words of encouragement. I find it even more encouraging, jump forward to verse 5, and Peter says that you also are living stones. We're living stones because of our faith in the living stone, the risen Lord Jesus. And as living stones, we too are alive. We experience Jesus' resurrection life now. And we eagerly look forward, as Peter wrote earlier in the book, to the inheritance that's being kept for us in heaven. The verse continues, you, like living stones, are being built as a spiritual house. You know, if you you have a wise master builder, that wise master builder can take stones and very skillfully, built upon the cornerstone, create a house, a house that relies entirely upon that cornerstone for its structure and reliability. Who's the master builder and what's going on? Look at the verse. The verse is passive. We are being built. This is not on us, guys. The Holy Spirit is the wise master builder whose sanctifying work is building us up into a spiritual house. Spiritual house. Great. Again, with these things that are hard to understand, what's going on? So, the word for house in both Greek and Hebrew simply means a dwelling place. So, in the case of the place where I live, a normal, average, everyday person, it's a house. But the place where God dwells. In Hebrew and Greek, is the same word. It's a house. 
But we would say that the place where God dwells is his temple. So what Peter is saying is that we, the community of believers, are being built by the Holy Spirit into God's dwelling place, into God's new temple. That's the spiritual house Peter has in mind. It's beautiful Old Testament imagery because in the Old Testament, you had the people of Israel. And where was God? Living right in the middle of town in the tabernacle, right there with his people. One of my favorite passages in Isaiah is this. It's Isaiah 57, 15. Thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Imagine for a second that you're a first century believer suffering from persecution. The Lord is not some far distant God a billion miles away. No, no, no. The infinite creator God of the universe delights to dwell with those who are humble in heart. Like you, suffering and persecuted believer. So, when we are going through difficult times, we should recognize that the Holy Spirit is dwelling within our hearts, as the text tells us, for the purpose of reviving our spirits. You know, there's another implication to this whole temple metaphor, of course. The Lord's temple is holy ground. It's a holy place. As we mentioned, holy simply means it's set aside for God's use. And as a result, unclean things were not brought into the temple. This makes perfect sense, doesn't it? I mean, last week we read Peter quoting from the Old Testament, be holy as the Lord is holy. And then verses 22 last week and 1 Peter 2, 1 this morning, holiness and purity were emphasized as being characteristics that should be true of God's holy people. These characteristics of holiness and purity and love should be the very front and center of the temple building. When the world looks at Christ's church, those should be the first architectural details that they notice to the glory of the Lord. Verse 5 next explains why we're being built up as a spiritual house and finally getting around to our vocation. The purpose is so that we can be a holy priesthood. Now, in a few minutes, we'll talk about what we'll do as a priesthood. Right now, I want to talk about what it means to be a holy priesthood. Again, remember the context. Peter's writing to us as a community of believers. So he's not thinking mainly of us as individual priests, although there is something there, the primary message is to us collectively as the priesthood, as God's set apart for his purposes, holy priesthood. So, think back. Before salvation, we all lived for ourselves. Our our vocation was summed up by the phrase, look out for number one. It's all about me. Myself and I. But now, we've been born again to a living hope through faith in Jesus. And the Lord has given us a new identity. We are elect exiles. Saints. He's also given us a new vocation. The community of believers is to be a holy priesthood. That's our new job, guys. And you know, whenever you make a major change, you know, change jobs, open a new business, you always wonder, what are people going to think of this? Because we're social beings, right? We're we're designed for community. We're concerned about the opinions of others. What are people going to think about us? What are they going to say about us? So it's natural to ask, what are people going to think about my new vocation as part of God's holy priesthood? Peter answers for us. We start by considering Jesus, who, after all, is the very foundation of for our status as his holy priesthood. Jesus, we see in verse 4, was rejected by men. This is what we call an understatement. Uh, He was crucified by those who rejected him. 
Crucifixion is, was designed to be absolutely horrendous, inflicting the maximum possible physical pain, and done in a way that would inflict the maximum possible shame and humiliation to the person being crucified. Verse 7, you see again, Jesus is the cornerstone who the builders rejected. Peter's quoting Psalm 118 there. So what do we learn? Well, we learn that Jesus was rejected by men. Now, a couple weeks ago, in 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7, we saw that Peter's first century readers in Asia Minor were also being rejected by their culture. They were suffering. And they were experiencing shame. It really, though, shouldn't surprise Peter's readers or us that people who obediently follow Jesus are likely to be rejected by men just as he was. I mean, after all, Jesus had taught that very message to Peter and the disciples more than once. Let's give you one of them. John 16, Jesus says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have trouble, tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. So, what will the world think of your vocation as, as priests? Honestly, rejection is the likely response according to Scripture. But the text tells us that's not the only reaction to our vocation. Look at verse 4 again. There's another reaction. Jesus, in the sight of God, is chosen and precious. And then look at verse 6. Jesus is a cornerstone chosen and precious. Jesus was loved and honored by God. So it's true, in, in 33 AD, he was rejected by men, but he enjoys the eternal love, acceptance, and honor of Abba Father. Which one of those do you think is more important? Peter asked that same question to his readers, including you and me. I mean, what really matters? The shame that you might experience if sinful men reject you, or the eternal approval that God the Father bestows upon you because you trust in his Son. When going through hard times, it really, really helps keep that eternal perspective in mind. It helps us to address the challenges we face right now. So, it's God's reaction to our vacation, vocation that matters the most, and Peter continues to explore that theme in verse 6. Peter says that those who come to Jesus will never be put to shame. And here he's quoting from Isaiah chapter 28, and in chapter 28, Isaiah begins by delivering for God a message of judgment because God's people did not trust the Lord. Instead of trusting the Lord, they trusted in political alliances and military alliances with the nations. Because after all, how could you trust in God? So there's judgment. But judgment is not God's last word in that passage. Well, pretty much ever, really. Judgment in Isaiah 28 gives way to God's promise. To God's promise that he will lay a sure foundation, a cornerstone, and that whoever trusts in that cornerstone will never be put to shame. By doing so, God is creating a new community that is defined by people's trust in that sure foundation. So fast forward about 700 years after Isaiah's life, Simon Peter is living in Judea. He's a disciple of somebody who he comes to discover is that sure foundation. And that's why Peter writes to us here in Isaiah, in 1 Peter 2.6, quoting Isaiah, that whoever believes in him, Jesus, will never be put to shame. These are encouraging words for suffering saints. But it, but it gets even better. As you look at verse 7, Peter says that those who believe those who are members of God's holy priesthood 
are honored in God's sight. So Peter wants us to focus on this. Who is it who is accepting or rejecting? Who is it that is bestowing honor or shame? The world rejected Jesus, but to the Father, Jesus is precious. The world may reject you because of your trust in Jesus, but God sees you as his treasured possession. We always decide which group's opinion matters the most to us. So what about you? Whose opinion matters to you? I want to think about this issue of honor for a second from another angle. What is the basis for honor in the world's eyes? How does the world decide whether you're you're honorable or not? Well, in our culture, I think we, we look to education, especially in a college town, right? Wealth, skills, job performance, athletic performance, family identity, all sorts of things like that. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, and the verses that follow, throw away that measuring rod, replacing it with God's method for setting value. The passage tells us that God values and desires faith. He desires us to trust Jesus as Savior. So you look at verse 7. Those who trust in Jesus, the living cornerstone, are the Lord's royal priesthood. They're honored by God. He takes them as his treasured possession. They will stand vindicated on the great day when the Lord Jesus returns to judge and then to reign forever. Now look at verse 8. In verse 8, Jesus is still the stone, but the response is different. Rather than belief, we find people who are offended by the gospel, who are offended by Jesus, and therefore they reject Jesus. Therefore, for him, for them, Jesus becomes a stone that they trip over. The rejection of Jesus leads to everlasting shame. So, we established we have a new vocation. It's God's holy priesthood. We've asked, what are people going to think about this? Peter's shown us that the life of Jesus functions as a pattern for the lives of his readers. Like Jesus, Peter's readers are despised by many, but they're chosen and honored in God's sight, destined for vindication after suffering. So the third part, the third aspect, if you will, of our vocation as holy priests is that our vocation has a purpose. The first purpose is found in chapter 2, verse 5, and we are being built up as a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So we offer spiritual sacrifices. Why spiritual sacrifices? I think the answer is this, because we are able to offer sacrifices that are acceptable to God because the Holy Spirit dwells within us and empowers us to do these things, which that brings me then to the point that we offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God. What does acceptable mean? It means something that God would welcome, something that's pleasing in his sight. And and God is the one After all, who's going to decide what's pleasing to God, right? Fortunately, in Scripture, he gives us all kinds of ideas of sacrifices that would delight him. We've seen a couple of examples just so far in 1 Peter. Last week, we saw that our sincere love for one another is a sacrifice that is pleasing to the Lord. Today, we saw that it pleases God when when we are holy, tearing off those sinful garments and throwing them away and putting on holy garments as he is holy. But it's a lot broader than that, I think. Looking at verse 5, we offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Jesus, after all, is the basis for our priesthood and for our salvation. So I think what Peter is after here is that anything we do through Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, will be pleasing in God's sight. Do you have any creative types out here? Creative people? I know we've got a bunch of musicians. It's a very creative thing. One of my favorite historical musicians long ago, Johann Sebastian Bach. At the bottom of every single piece of music he wrote are three words. Soli Deo Gloria. 
to the glory of God alone. He took this massive gift that God gave him, this creative gift of music, and he applied it to the glory of God. That's a spiritual sacrifice that's pleasing and acceptable to God. Musicians, thank you for exercising your gifts in that way for us this morning. I think of the beautiful artwork we had up here that Leah made that's now over in the fellowship hall. There are all sorts of ways that you can exercise your creativity as sacrifices that are pleasing and beautiful to the Lord. I'll give you another example. There's a novel I love. It's called Safely Home by Randy Alcorn. And one of the main characters in the book is a street sweeper. And he's a guy who says that he is a street sweeper to the glory of God. This is a humble occupation. But his point, I think, is valid and biblical, that literally anything that we do for Christ in the Spirit will be acceptable and pleasing to the Father. This is an understanding, I think, that fits perfectly with Micah, chapter 6, verse 8. He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So the first reason we've been called to be God's holy priesthood is so that we will offer spiritual sacrifices that are pleasing in God's sight through Jesus Christ. The second purpose for our priesthood is in verse 9, if you turn there. We are a royal priesthood so that we may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Look at the timeline in that verse. There's a timeline that's implicit there. What's the first thing that's in there chronologically? The first thing chronologically is we're in darkness. We are slaves to sin and death. There's futility. We're separated from God. What's the second thing that happens? God acts. He graciously calls us out of darkness into his marvelous light. He chooses us. Remember, that's where Peter started back in verse 1, addressing us as elect chosen exiles. Also remember 1 Peter 1, 3, out of God's great mercy, God caused us to be born again to a living hope through Jesus. So the second act in this verse is that God acts. Third, because of God's gracious action, we have a new identity. We collectively are his chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. This is absolutely stunning. By using these words, Peter is reminding us of all of the ways in the Old Testament that God addressed his holy people and applying them to us. You take those three steps, and that's the gospel in a nutshell, isn't it? Darkness, God acts light. The fourth thing that this text brings to us is that there is a totally natural, reasonable, Logikos, reaction to what God has already done. That natural, logical, normal reaction is that we proclaim the excellencies, the wonderfulness of our great God and Savior. We do that in a lot of ways, don't we? Sometimes we might do it in front of a group of people, doing it right now. You might do it if you lead a Bible study or an OAG or you just talk to your OAG, or if you're a children's Sunday school teacher. There are so many ways we can do it formally, but we also proclaim Christ's excellencies when talking to individuals. Maybe somebody you know who's a seeker asks you questions about Jesus because they want to know, and you proclaim Christ's excellencies to them. Or, Or maybe you're talking to somebody and you're sharing with them some aspect of your life, some way that the Lord came through, some way that you tasted and saw that he was good. By doing so, you proclaim his excellencies. So we are given a walk, we're given a diet, and we're given a vocation in this passage. As I think about these these things in the last couple of weeks, I find myself, I'm just really thankful that we have this opportunity to have a series in 1 Peter. I'm thankful that we, together as a family, are drinking this pure spiritual milk, together. And I'm delighting in Peter's letter because it's causing us to focus on a different aspect of our identity. Saints. God's holy people. 
God's holy priesthood. You know, over the years, I've heard a ton of sermons and Sunday school messages and other things talking about the fact that, that we're all sinners. And that, that's true. We struggle with sin. I got it. But it's not the whole story. If you are in Christ, I need to get the context right. If y'all are in Christ, then y'all are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and a people who are God's prized possessions. And all of these things are true of you so that your daily life will be filled with spiritual sacrifices that please the Father, and so that you can proclaim the excellencies of the Lord Jesus who has given you this precious new life. And that, Creekside, that is a vision worth living for. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I pray that I may live this day in your presence and that the things that I do will please you more and more and more. Lord Jesus, I pray that this day I may take up my cross and follow you. Holy Spirit, I pray that this day you will fill me with yourself that you will cause your fruit to ripen in my life, and that I will bear a rich harvest of love, and joy, and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Gracious triune God, may these things be true of me and of all of us this day.